Welcome to the third episode of Collection Curator. Here's what's happening on the farm. It is um, Friday, February 12th when I'm recording this and we have had um, storms coming in across the country one after another. Um, today's storm, we just had a little bit of flurries and I think the big action is down in Virginia. Um, so we're just sitting here in the deep freeze. It's um, not above freezing yet. None of the um, snow that came down Wednesday night into Thursday morning, none of that has really thawed out. Um, Bill did plow the driveway yesterday, and so we can get in and out of here, which is always a good thing. <laughs> That's probably one of the worst feelings is when there's too much snow and you're sort of blocked in and your equipment isn't working and how are you going to get out? That happened to us one year. There was one year where they called it Snowmageddon. And I think like within a week, I want to say that we had like 50 inches of snow. It was horrendous. And it was a time where we were counting on our landscape guy to come and plow us out. And Bill had started with the snow blower, um, but then the snow blower broke, of course. Doesn't that always happen? Uh, you know, when you, when you need something, it's the first thing that breaks. Um, he tried using our tractor. We have a big John Deere tractor with a bucket. Um, but at the time, the wheels were on the outside of the bucket. So he couldn't really drive on the snow and use the bucket. Um, so that didn't work. So, you know, we called Chuck and Chuck was going to come over as soon as he was done with all the, all of his contract work. And he came over and he couldn't get through, um, because there was so much snow that his, his truck wouldn't handle it. So we ended up calling, um, the guy at the end of the driveway and he was able to come and plow us out. I think we were stuck. I want to say at least three days, um, without being able to get in and out. And at that time we weren't relying so heavily on packages. Now, you know, who isn't doing Chewy or Bo uh, Blue Apron or HelloFresh or, you know, getting everything on Amazon. Um, you know, we're just depending on people coming down this driveway um, a lot. So I'm happy we're plowed. The driveway is decent. It's not icy. So that's great. And that's what's happening on the farm. So let's get back into becoming the curator of your collection, episode three. So did you do it? Come on. Did you go and have some meaningful visits and conversation with your collection? I sure hope so. Um, I'd love for you to let me know what you discovered. You can always send me an email or tag me in a post. Um, you can always use hashtag collection curator. I follow that all the time. I wanted to talk a little bit more seriously about putting skeins together for a project because I know that that's a hard thing um, for a lot of people to do. Um, I find that a lot of people um, don't have a lot of confidence when putting yarns together, what goes well with what. And so this is a perfect opportunity for you to kind of hone those skills and bring, you know, get some, build in some confidence for, you know, your color sense, because, you know, each person's color sense is a little different. What I might put together and love, you might think, oh my gosh, why did she put those things together? Um, you probably noticed it if you've gone shopping or to at a, at a festival or a local yarn store with a friend. You've probably noticed that you might you might pick different things than she than your friend would pick. Um, and sometimes uh, maybe you kind you kind of like her advice, but it's not really who you are at your core. So it's just about you know finding and building that confidence. So. When you're putting together skeins for a project, the first thing I think that is the most important is that all of the skeins that you put together should be of the same grist or standard weight, 
or they should be really, really close. Um, unless you want to be carrying two strands at a time um, for your smaller one, and that and that's possible too. But when you're first starting out trying to put skeins together for a project, try to come up with things that skeins that go together that this are the same, like they're all finger length, fingering, or they're all sport weight, or um, you know, maybe you have one that's um, a heavy DK and one that's a light worsted, like my Trasna and Lively, they will work fine together. There's not that much difference between them. Um, you know, a few less yards per pound in that Lively that's uh, like a, a light worsted, as opposed to the Trasna has a few more yards per pound for being a heavy DK. But they will work together. You don't have to change needles. You don't have to double things up. You're not going to have like a thin spot and a th and like a thicker, more densely packed spot. So that's what I'm saying. Try to keep them all the same, especially when you're just beginning. And that will just make your job easier when it's time to pick a pattern, and um, t and when it's time to start to knit or you know pick what needles that you want to use because they'll all be relatively close. Um, the way to do this is just again to make a great big old pile. Let's just say you're gonna do, you're gonna look for, um, to put projects for a shawl. And you want that shawl to be kind of lightweight um, and maybe a little airy. And so it's gonna be fingering weight. So pull out your a big old pile of fingering weight yarns. And then what I would suggest is for you to start putting those skeins into color families, like put all the blues together, put all the purples, the greens and oranges, you get the picture, put them in, you know, you could even make it kind of like a color wheel on a bed or on the floor. Um, or you can, you know, make it like a rainbow in a line. Um, and if you are, have a lot of variegated yarns, kind of um, squint your eyes a little bit and pick out what is the most dominant color and put those variegateds in with that dominant color. If you've got um, a variegated that's like a green, blue, and lilac, it's going to probably go into your your blue area unless it's like, depending on the percentages, I guess, if it has a huge part of lilac and a little teeny part of green, and a middle size of blue, maybe it goes in your purple pile. You see what I mean? You put it like what the dominant color of that variegated yarn is and put it in that pile. Then you start putting them together. Typically, I would say in, um, if we're, we're still talking about fingering weight yarns, and fingering weight yarns are typically have, um, let's say three to 400 um, yards per skein. And so if you choose three of those, that's a 1200 yard shawl. That's going to be pretty nice. That's a, if you have four together, that's going to be a 1600 um, yard shawl. And that might be huge, but like some of those, like the find your fades and stuff, some of those are really long and really big. So you might need to have the four. Um, and what, so we just start putting to, them together. My rule of thumb is like one variegated and two that are mostly solid. Um, or you can have one variegated, one mostly solid, and maybe one that's a spreckly one um, would be good too. Um, also, it's great if you have, if you want to put different textures together. So if you have a variegated that's a sparkly and you put it together with um, a semi-solid or a spreckled that is more of a matte finish. Um, and then maybe you have one of those that has like the little noils in them um, that looks like kind of a tweedy look. That would be really pretty together. Or think about if you have those things with the nibs, the, the yarn with the nibs in it, and you have a shiny one like um, that has a lot of silk in it. Um, would be really fun because you're, you're now you're working with those textures as well as the colors. And my other suggestion is the colors don't have to match exactly. They just have to look good next to each other. 
Um, and like some colors are just really hard to match. And so, and if you put them together, they may look weird. And that's just about using your eye and saying, no, that doesn't look right. Uh, specifically, I'm talking a lot about purple and red because there are so many different nuances to purples and to reds. You can have them on the warm side, um, more of a red violet or more of a blue violet. Um, and if they're, and putting those together may look really good, but if it's not, but if it's not quite the right ones, it's going to go, Ooh, it's going to make your eyes go, Ooh, no, that's not right. And you'll know it because you kind of will get a visceral reaction to it. You will get, um, just that, Oh no, yeah, no, that's wrong. And so save that out for a different, um, different set. Same with the reds, because you can have reds that are on the orange side or the, and that would be more of the warm and you can have reds that are more on the blue side. And so a lot of times those don't match up so great either. Um, so just, you're, you're just going to start playing with this. And remember, it's about having fun, finding joy and playing with this. And you're going to audition them. You're going to put them into groups and you can sit with them. You can put them to get together, um, you know, maybe spend half an hour, an hour, put a, several sets together, walk away, go do something else and come back later and say, oh, do I like these still? You know, and again, do that visceral reaction. Does it make you go, wow, or does it make you go, oh, no, that's not good. Um, and if it's, if you get that, oh, no, that's not good, mix them up again. But when you find the ones that go, oh yeah, that, I love that, put them in a bag together. And, you know, write on the bag, you know, um, curated collection for shawl. You don't have to know today what that shawl is going to be, but you know that you put that aside to make a shawl. Um, and it's kind of like going shopping in your collection because it's, and it's like kind of like having your own private little yarn store, right? And hopefully these yarns that you still have left are the ones that do bring you joy. Um, I hope that you have made some progress on getting um, the uh, yarns that aren't you anymore out of your collection. Again, you can set those aside in a bag. I hate to call it a trash bag, a big plastic bag, or even in boxes and, um, you know, set it aside for donation, um, set it aside for a yarn swap. Um, you know, I think a lot of you know that knitting is like the last craft that I've picked up. Um, and I do have a little bit of my own private stash as well. And I was doing this same, um, that having the same adventure with my stash a couple of years ago. And I was surprised that I still, I had a lot of yarn in there that is like, I had just grown out of, you know, I had maybe it was stuff that I had bought at Joann's cause it was a novelty yarn. It was pretty. Um, and maybe I thought I would make something out of it, but it, now I'm like, Oh no, I, I think I've outgrown that or it's outgrown me or my life has just gone in a different direction. And again, I don't want you to be looking at those yarns that are no longer you and saying that is, you know, that is my pile of shame over there. No, you've grown out of it. You've grown away from it. Your paths have diverged and there are plenty of people out there who would, who would love to have those yarns. You're not making a judgment about those yarns. They don't just don't fit your crafting anymore. They just aren't your raw materials anymore. Once they were the raw materials that you would, um, and you would have made things with, and you probably did, but now your paths have diverged. I really like thinking that. So this is part of the fun part. You guys is getting out these yarns, 
putting them together, auditioning them with their friends, and seeing who works really well together. It's going to be, I dare say it, it's, it's, this is, process is going to help you fall in love with your yarn all over again. Number one, you're going to remember what you got, right? You remember what you have in those bins and under the beds and in the closets. And number two, now you're putting them together into project-sized allotments. And it's going to make you say, oh, wow, look at all this that I have. What can I do now? This is fantastic. All right. So the next steps for your collection are this. You know, you visited your collection. You know what you have. And you also know what you need, right? This is a perfect time for you to make a wish list for your next festival or going to a, a yarn store or um, I'm still holding out for a festival because that's so much fun because there's so many things to do, so many things to see, different smells, different vendors, um, funnel cakes, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know what you have in your collection and what pieces are missing. So if you don't have, let's just, for an example, if you don't have any yellows, but you think that you might want one for your, for a shawl pattern, or you have these two yarns and there's like a tiny bit of gold in one. And wouldn't that be a nice addition for that, for that shawl package that you just put together? Then put that on your list, put the color, put the weight. And when I mean weight, I'm talking about fingering, DK, um, worsted, those kind of weights. And if you know what you would like to look for, you can put in your texture, like I want a shiny one. I want um, a sparkly one. I want one with Tweety Noils in it. Um, and then you have your list. And then you can be more purposeful when you go to a festival. And, um, that is always fun to be on a mission, be on a mission to, to fill in your collection. Just like a curator at the art museum would be. They know, you know, if they, you know, in their impressionist room that they need to have another Monet, then they'll go and look for the Monet. That's what you're doing, making a wish list. So I kind of wanted to go into this part too a little bit today, even though this is going to be a larger um, topic that's coming up later in the season, and that's color confidence. Um, it can really help you in this stage that we're at with your collection. And um, so I wanted to, to bring it up now. Um, I suggest that to start getting more confidence in your color picking is for you to be to make Pinterest boards to make color inspiration a colors inspiration board or more than one it depends how crazy you get um, and so make this board in Pinterest and what I mean is that you're gonna start collecting photos on that board and photos that excite your eyes and excite your heart I do not think you should put in um, yarn photos. I'm not talking about that, people. What I'm saying is put in landscapes, still lives, shells, leaves, rust. I love pictures of rust. Um, maybe you put in um, like a, an embroidered something or other, an embroidered jacket or something like that, that what, that you just love the way the colors work on it. You're looking specifically at colors and you're going to start adding these to your board. And then this is another thing that you can come and visit every once in a while. It's a way for you to understand what your personal sense of color is. Because the pictures that I pick, like I just told you, I've got a lot of pictures of rust in my color inspiration boards. You may think that's crazy, Lisa. Why would you be picking pictures of rust? Um, and you, you may have like beach pictures or sunrise pictures or 
something like that. You're, we each have our own personal sense of color. And, you know, the things that we love to look at um, are going to help us, drive us into choosing yarns for patterns that will also really excite us. If you are someone who loves pictures of the dawn of dawn at the beach, um, and so you know that's light pinks and like purples and maybe some sand colors, then if you go to a fiber festival, you have no business picking up a teal, orange, or brown rust colored set of yarn, right? So this will give you confidence. Oh, these are the colors that I know that I like that go together because they go together in nature. They go together in this photograph. So think about it. Again, if you would like, I am on Pinterest under Flying Goat Farm and you can um, follow my color inspiration board. Um, and I would love to see what your boards look like as well. So yeah, you're going to use these photos to help you put your yarns together for your collection. Um, it's, it's not only, f I, I get lost on Pinterest. Um, I'm sure a lot of us do. Um, so it's not only fun in that way, but it's also educational. And um, it's going to help develop your creation superpower. Your superpower of being confident in the colors, knowing your, color sen your, your color, personal color sense, and knowing that I can pick yarns that go together that I am going to love. So let's talk a little bit about patterns. Um, so you visited your yarn and or your roving collection. I know I've talked a lot about yarn. If you're a spinner, you're doing the same exact thing with your roving. Keep the ones that you really like, throw out the ones that don't uh, make you happy anymore. Um, put together ones that you think would go well, like to be two different plies. Um, get them organized. So you've organized your yarn or roving. You've deleted the items that bring you shame or don't bring you joy. And now it is time to deal with patterns. This is a scary topic. In the last episode, I did talk a little bit about the three baskets, kind of baskets, I'm air quoting, that... Um, Ravelry has for you to use. So here's a quick wrap up of that, recap of that. So Ravelry has three baskets. You have a library, you have a queue, and you have favorites. Your library is a page where your purchased or free patterns are. You can also put in into your library patterns that you have not bought yet, but you, you are interested in buying. That's like the easiest place to find anything is in your little library section. The queue. The queue is the lineup of patterns that you intend to knit. And I think to be really valuable, this has to be like only three to six patterns. Like what can you knit, seriously knit in let's say six months? See, if it was me, I would have two patterns in there. <laughs> but a lot of you are faster knitters than me. So maybe you have six. But this is your patterns that you know that you are going to knit right away and that you, this is a pared down version. This is a way that you can get um, really uh, get easily like a shortcut to get easily to that pattern without having to look through all your library or looking through favorites. So your cue is what you intend to knit in the next, let's say, six months. How many things can you possibly knit? and only have that much in your queue. You might ask me, is that the way that I have mine set up? Not right now. I was just thinking, I probably have a lot in that queue because I didn't understand what it was and I haven't looked at that queue um, over maybe a year. So once I finish this podcast, I'm going to Ravelry and figure that out. And then the last kind of basket that they have are favorites. You can always favorite or heart um, a pattern or a project or even the yarns that you like. You're, um, you're still thinking about these, but you haven't bought it. You're just curious. 
So those are the three places. And it's well worth doing exactly what we did with our yarns um, and our roving. So on Ravelry, you do need to go in and clean it up. You need to take out the patterns that you have outgrown. You know, look at each one of the patterns that you have in those places. Your queue, your, you don't have to look at your favorites, but look in your queue and your library. Weed out the ones that you um, aren't interested in anymore. You've outgrown them. Your paths have diverted. Get rid of them. Um, if it's something that you bought, it will always be in your library. Um, but I think you can sort them in a different way so that maybe the older ones can go to the end of the end of the pages so that you don't have to be seeing them all the time. Now I know a lot of us also have printed patterns. So what are you going to do with that? So there are two ways that I think that you can organize them. Um, the first way is to organize your, your patterns by the weight of the yarn. So is it a fingering pattern, a DK, um, a worsted, a sport? And the second way to organize them is by garment type, like hat. The, the, here's all my hat patterns. Here's all my mitten patterns. Here's all my sweater patterns. And it doesn't matter what the weight is that you need. Um, and I suggest that you put these in notebooks. Again, so that they are easy to, um, to find. They're easy to organize. Personally, I, for me, and I think this is, either way is a good way. I think it's just all a matter of how your mind works, and especially, you know, imagine yourself at a fiber festival. What would be the what would be the easiest way for you to use those patterns um, to to buy the yarn that you need for a project? For me, I think, oh, I'm mean, first. I'm going to look at the yarn. So I'm looking at this yarn, and I really, really love it. And, you know, what can I make with this? And it's a fingering weight. So if I have put all of my patterns into, um, into those weights, those standard weights, then I can just look through my fingering section and I can decide, oh, there's, oh yeah, there's that shawl. Oh, I just need two of these. There are two on the, on the shelf here, I'm going to take that. So that's the way that I think makes sense for me. Um, and yes, does that mean that you have to carry a notebook around? Yeah, kind of. Um, or if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to carry a notebook around, it you probably then should stick with Ravelry because you can then search your patterns um, by the, the weight etc. Um, so think about that. I have a customer who, um, she lives in another state, but she comes and visits family here. And when she's here, they come and shop and she always has her notebook with her. And that's where I got this idea. Like this was really smart. Um, she always has what she, what she needs. And on the other hand, there are lots of people who are really, really good at Ravelry on their phone and they can look up um, their patterns, look up things that are in their library and um, make a decision about how much yarn to buy. And then what about magazines or books? What do you do with those patterns? So I think you can integrate those into the previous two systems. You can add those patterns that are from a magazine or a book into Ravelry. A lot of those patterns are listed on Ravelry and they'll say that they belong to a book. So you could go in and put them in um, into your library or into your queue. Or if you are going to be the notebook person, then you can take a copy and make sure that what the copy, I would say, has to have the picture and it has to have the tech info. Like, how much yardage do you need? What is the weight? Put that in your notebook. 
So, because you don't want to be carrying, you cannot carry around the magazines and the books. That doesn't make any sense, right? Um, it's bad enough if you want to carry around a notebook. Um, but this this is the way that I think makes sense in organization for your books and your magazines. So now what? Here's kind of like your homework, you guys. I hope that you're going to follow along on this adventure. Um, and if so, here are a few things that you can be working on until the next podcast inst installment. One, start your Pinterest board for color confidence and in inspiration. It can be called, called color inspiration or just color. Maybe you do one that's like warm colors and cool color inspiration, warm color inspiration, that kind of thing. I hope that you'll go through your yarns and group those yarns together because I think that is going to be the most fun, like going shopping in your collection. And while your collection is still fresh in your mind, go ahead and make a wish list of things that you want to look for that will fill out your collection and make it more valuable. Organize your patterns in some way that will work for you, whether that's on Ravelry, whether that's on um, in a notebook, or even some other way. I mean, I guess you could make an Excel spreadsheet if the, if you're that kind. You know, if that's your preferred method, um, that can be done because you can put a picture in an, in a spreadsheet. You can put the technical information there too. And while you're doing this stuff, send me a photo. It, send it to my email. Or put it in social media and then use collection curator, hashtag collection curator, and tag me, Flying Goat Farm, so that I can see your progress. I love seeing what people are doing. And um, I hope that you are beginning to fall in love with your yarn collection once again. And until we meet again in person, virtually or here on the podcast. Happy making.